At the Filton BOAC factory in Bristol, British workers laboured on Concord 002. Because of the Anglo-French double production line, a new way of manufacturing aircraft came into being. Previously, aeroplanes had been assembled as a shell, then components inserted inside. With the Concorde, many of the systems were installed at the component stage, then brought to the assembly line already functional. This was the case with the nose and forward fuselage built at Weybridge. The 50-foot long section was made up of the flight deck, the forward passenger cabin, and the nose landing gear bay. When brought to the final assembly line, the sections were fitted with cabin insulation, hydraulics and air conditioning, comprising 25,000 parts and 90 miles of wiring. We have a camera specially rigged on the tail to give you a close-up view of what happens when you break the sound barrier. Let me tell you what to watch for. First, notice the deep color of the sky, how much darker it is at 45,000 feet where Tony will start his dive. You are not only far above the clouds, but also above the haze and dust of the lower atmosphere. You are looking at the pure ultraviolet rays of outer space. There's the peel off. Now listen as the sound builds up. Usually, there are two thunderclaps. One, when the plane runs away from its sound, and the second, when the sound catches up again. Between the two, you are flying faster than the speed of sound, and it is absolutely silent. Now the sound is building up. The sound barrier has been broken. This is the silence of supersonic flight. Now the pullout is being made. Listen to the noise when the sound catches up. A bevy of air hostesses gathered at the Paris Air Show in 1967 to usher in a new era of passenger flight. At the center of attention was an aeroplane born from unprecedented cooperation between traditional rivals Britain and France. Christened Concorde, it was well named. A beautiful shape of things to come. A model of the Anglo-French Concorde airliner to be carrying 100 passengers by 1970. At Lancaster House, the aviation minister, Mr. Julian Amory, in company with the French ambassador, almost crooned in admiration over the brainchild of their two countries. On behalf of their governments, they signed the agreement for the joint development and production, a foretaste, perhaps, of common market cooperation. Concorde has a perfect pedigree. In the early days, the Ferry Delta II proved faster than sound flying to be possible. Then the French Trident, powered by two jets and a rocket motor, flew twice the speed of sound. At the Bedford Wind Tunnel, flight conditions at these fantastic speeds are simulated. A tremendous help to the designers of the airframe, in this case a model of the Concorde. Watching is the head of the Bristol design team of the British Aviation Corporation. On the test bed here, a Bristol Sydney Olympus engine, the type that will power the Concorde. The same engine has been tested in flight, powering a Vulcan bomber. Handley Page 115 demonstrated the possibility of handling the slender Delta Wing aircraft at low speed. More tests were made by the Bristol T-188 Flying Laboratory. With a pedigree like that, the Concorde should capture a big slice of the Atlantic traffic for Britain and France. Britain first started working on civilian faster-than-sound aircraft in the mid-1950s, when the Bristol Aeroplane Company developed the Type 233 supersonic jet. At the same time, France's Sud Aviation was working on the Super Caravelle, so in 1962, the two nations joined forces. Partly a reaction against the swift technological strides being taken by the Russians and Americans in their duel to reach the moon, the Anglo-French partnership was negotiated as an international treaty rather than a commercial agreement. But the project was not without controversy. 
The name itself was initially a bone of contention. Although the British originally spelt it with an E in the French style, British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan took offence at a comment from French leader Charles de Gaulle and ordered it to be spelt without the E. Eventually, British Minister for Technology Tony Benn proclaimed that the French spelling would be adopted by both countries, saying the E stood for Excellence, England, Europe and Entente. He subsequently received a letter from an angry Scot who said the Concorde was made in Scotland as well as England. Ben responded that the E could stand for Ecosse, the French name for Scotland, but in his memoirs he noted, and I might have added E for extravagance and E for escalation as well. For it was a massive project, and both sides underestimated the complexities involved. Britain was to construct 60% of the engine and 40% of the airframe, and France to construct 40% of the engine and 60% of the airframe. But with Concorde unlike any aeroplane previously built, the project stretched out long past its due date and chewed up far more than its allotted budget. We are very glad to have you with us this evening because uh, you, as uh, Chief Executive and General Manager of Qantas, Australia's overseas airline, uh, obviously the very person to tell us something about this, the background of this quite momentous news about uh, <clears throat> the authority that has been given to your airline to negotiate for 10 supersonic airliners. This seems to me to be pretty exciting news and we'd like to hear you tell us something about it. Thank you, Mr. Gillison. It is uh, exciting news. We've been working on the supersonic transport project for two years, uh, like many other airlines, and uh, this is the culmination of much work Although we've only, at the moment, got permission, as you'll see, to uh, pay deposits to secure positions in the line. There are very much more work and negotiation to be done in relation to the U.S. Uh, SST, as we call it, uh, supersonic transport. There's uh, actually no defined aircraft at the moment, and we're paying deposits in the dark. Uh, but we are also, of course, uh, enthusiastic about the Concorde, British-French uh, project, and that we've got uh, authority to pay deposits on four of those is uh, very encouraging news for us. But there's, as I say, there's much negotiation to be done. Well, what about this uh, um, authority to negotiate for six American airliners? There's the picture there. Of course, the American airline, uh, airliner, supersonic airliner, is not yet an airline. Uh, airliner, it's um, being decided about this time, and we'll know more about it within the next few months. But what we are doing there is paying deposits to secure positions in the future line. But then, uh, in, the, in that case, if... Uh, we don't want to go on with it by the end of 1965 if uh, it doesn't meet our specifications. We get the whole of the deposit back. This, in this instance, uh, in this way, it is slightly different to the type of contract um, that we are at, mo at the moment discussing with BAC Sort. Not to be outdone, the Russians pushed ahead with their own supersonic airliner, the Tupolev Tu-144, challenging Concorde in some areas of technology, but lacking Concorde's range, sophistication, braking and engine control. Despite many roadblocks, the Concorde vision flew on, with a model taking to the air for flight tests in 1966. The program was feeling some urgency because of the Boeing supersonic developments. But Concorde's designers were also convinced that the American plans were far too ambitious to be achieved in less than a decade. The SST was to have a speed of Mach 3, be constructed from titanium, and stretch at least 330 feet long, the length of a football field. A little more modest in scope, the Concorde could reach Mach 2.04, or 2,200 kilometers an hour, and was constructed from aluminium in a relatively conventional design compared to the SST. Its maximum cruise altitude was to be 60,000 feet, 
and average landing speed 298 kilometers an hour. Dangled below a helicopter on its test flight at the Royal Aircraft Establishment near Bedford, this model was only 1 20th the size of the real aircraft. Although it was attached to the helicopter by a tow rope, the model was controlled independently and could lift, roll and turn while recording instruments measured its performance. It also had a few moments of free flight. There were many structural issues to be considered in an aeroplane that was traveling at twice the speed of sound. With massive forces applied to the aircraft during banks and turns, the outboard elevons were neutralized at high speeds, leaving only the inner elevons active as they were attached to the strongest part of the wing. At this point in its development, more than 20 research establishments in Britain and France were working on the aircraft, and the budget had climbed to 380 million pounds sterling. Gradually, its parts started to take shape in workshops on both sides of the channel. At the Hispano Suiza factory in Paris, workers constructed the undercarriage of the prototype Concorde 001. It rested on a four-wheel bogey, standing four meters from the point of retraction to the bogey axis. Development of the Concorde was a leap into the unknown for designers and engineers. The machine and assembly shops built test specimens of the advanced RR58 aluminum alloy to ensure it could be fabricated using tried and true techniques. Titanium and stainless steel were also used in the engine bays to combat the high stress and high temperatures. Electron beam welding was perfected to enable production welding of the titanium, previously a very difficult task. In 1967, the design for the 001 and 002 prototypes was revised to reduce drag. The Concorde received a new drooping nose and visor and a longer fuselage. The trademark drooping nose gave the pilots increased visibility when the delta-winged aircraft took off and landed at a high angle of attack. When in flight, the nose was raised to horizontal to allow for aerodynamic streamlining through the air. There was no end to the ingenuity or patience of the Concorde designers. They undertook photographic analysis using Polaroid light to pinpoint the stresses that pressurization forces exert on welds. They carried out experiments to test the effects of kinetic heating on exterior paintwork and the effects of 40,000 hours of wear on seating fabrics. The designers called on the power of analog computers to measure and record the drag forces at various points of an aircraft wing during a simulated flight. And they carried out experiments in wind tunnels that were like test flights in miniature. With this model, aerodynamicists could study Concorde performance in every phase of flight, from takeoff to landing. When they came to cutting the metal used in the airplane, a process known as sculpture milling was used. In this process, 90% of the original material is machined away to be salvaged and used again. It was a costly method, but faster than any other, ensuring the structural integrity of the parts produced. Magnetic control of the machining operations ensured maximum speed and maximum accuracy, however complex the component. Chemi etching, another advanced technique, was used to produce components. Forming was done by successive immersions in acid. During immersion, the parts that will finally stand out in relief are protected. The first components to come off the assembly lines in Britain and France were assembled into fuselage sections for extensive structural testing. The components also underwent fatigue testing, where cyclic loadings were imposed on the specimen to simulate the stress and strain of actual flight. For air conditioning tests, a fuselage section was encased in a high-altitude chamber. To check the efficiency of the cabin cooling system, thermocouples took the temperature of the metal passengers. But not everyone was enamored with the technological milestones being reached through the Concorde program. In 1966, a saboteur smashed an important engine part at the Bristol Sidley Aircraft Factory in Bristol. The smashed engine part was found with a hammer lying nearby and a note that read, This is the mallet which did the job. I wish I could be here to see the fun. Both workers and management were furious at the sabotage and resolved not to let the incident disrupt their schedule. The aeroplane was due to be delivered 21 months later. 
Although the sabotage meant the Olympus 593 engine would be affected, factory management was adamant that the Concorde would meet its delivery date. However, the project was already running behind schedule. This was less to do with sabotage and more to do with the complex collaboration between engineers from different countries. There were constant problems with getting on-time delivery from outside contractors, mostly because of the extensive testing required before the materials could be used on the Concorde. To distract attention from what was rapidly becoming a costly and delayed operation, the British trumpeted the opening of a super wind tunnel. When the time came for Concorde to make its first test flight, it was a momentous experience. Technology Minister Tony Benn remembered it as quite extraordinary. It was typically British and extraordinarily exciting, and I must say that when I took off, the vibration made me feel like I was being filleted, my skin falling off my skeleton, he said. I did arrange for a supersonic bang to take place over Cabinet, and I told the Prime Minister and no one else. Ben sat behind the pilots wearing a parachute and filming the occasion. He next flew on the aircraft in 1976 with a group of people who had worked on its construction for 20 or 30 years but had never previously had the opportunity to fly in the luxury jet. Many tests were carried out on the new aeroplanes, including a slate of noise tests. Engineer Dick Hale, a member of the Weybridge Acoustics Department, was one of those who worked on the experiments. At first, engine tests were conducted close to the assembly building. Later, a custom-built ground base was built next to the yet-to-be-operational runway. There were six in the BAC team, all in our early 20s, our team leader being just 24, Hale recalled. I was a new qualified engineer, just six months out of my apprenticeship, and helped set up the equipment, calibrate it, and operate the recording amplifiers and tape deck. The measurements were made around a 60-meter radius centered on the port side engines and covered an angular range from 25 to 180 degrees to jet exhaust. These relatively close-in measurements were to minimize the effects of wind and temperature gradients on noise propagation. The weather conditions were far from ideal with plenty of wind and rain. The ground over which the microphone cables were laid was sodden and the damp wormed its way into much of the measuring equipment causing numerous reliability problems. However, after three to four weeks of intermittent testing, a full set of recordings were obtained, which included single and multi-engine running, operation of the Snecma spade silencers, and qualification of the fixed ground running silencers. The recorded data formed a base for in-flight projections and the study of installation effects of closely coupled engines. Hale said his most embarrassing moment occurred when he was waiting to record the first ever installed engine reheat run. Our French colleagues indicated on the radio that the afterburner was lit. We hit the record button and the mains power to our test equipment dropped out. We looked out of the recording caravan window to see the mains cable flapping in the exhaust of the Olympus engine. At this high power setting, the ground covering the mains cable was eroded by the engine exhaust, exposing the cable and pulling it from the junction box. We buried it deeper next time. The extent of Concorde testing and certification was unique in the history of aviation. The prototype, pre-production and first production aircraft undertook 5,335 flight hours, 2,000 of which were supersonic. It went through four times as many tests as a standard aircraft. The first four Concorde aircraft were really flying laboratories, wired up with 12 tons of electric test instrumentation capable of recording measurements of 3,000 different parameters, including pressures, temperatures, accelerations and attitudes. This information was recorded to magnetic tape for later analysis at ground data processing centers. In flight, certain information was cabled down to ground monitoring stations. At the front of each aircraft, there was room for three flight observers who monitored the behavior of the airplane and its systems through instruments duplicating the information appearing on the flight deck. One of the most important tests was flutter testing, where vibrations occurring in one part of an aeroplane can set off vibrations in another part, potentially leading to structural failure. But, not surprisingly, the extensive testing caused a budget blowout by the end of the process. Originally slated to cost £380 million sterling, the cost had rocketed to more than a billion pounds by 1976, 
when the aeroplane made its first scheduled passenger flights. On October 1, 1969, Concorde 001 reached a milestone when it flew at supersonic speeds for the first time, achieving Mach 1.5 and flying supersonically for nine minutes. Those on board were astonished at the absence of noise when the visor was raised. Only seven months after that flight, four airline captains were given the opportunity to fly Concorde 001. The men trained in the Toulouse Concorde flight simulator and tried out many predicaments, including engine failure and a three-engine landing. They later reported the aircraft was simple to fly, and they could see no reason why pilots and engineers couldn't be trained to operate it. The following year, both prototypes reached Mach 2 and passed 300 hours flying time. It was really looking as if supersonic passenger flight was possible. While the military had been flying at supersonic levels for many years, to construct an aircraft capable of sustaining the high structure temperature required for sustained flight was no easy task. Most of Concorde's test flights were flown over sea. However, the British government set up special provisions to enable the aeroplanes to occasionally fly over land as well. A route was designed over Scotland, Wales and Ireland, carefully planned to remain within the range of air and ground rescue services. Fortunately, they were not required, but some people were disturbed by the startling sonic boom that would unexpectedly explode from the aeroplane as it crashed through the sound barrier. The first serious incident in the Concorde program occurred in January 1971, when 001 experienced an engine surge while flying at supersonic speed. One of the movable ramps in the engine air intake broke free, and metal fragments were ingested by the engine, causing a large amount of damage. The engine was immediately shut down, and 001 returned to Toulouse on three engines. The problem was fixed and never returned. Throughout 1971, 001 and 002 toured the world, thrilling people with their exploits. 001 made 16 flights in 15 days to places such as Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo and Buenos Aires. Distinguished guests who tried out the cutting-edge aeroplanes included President Pompidou of France and the Duke of Edinburgh. A trained pilot himself, the Duke even took over the controls for part of his flight. To rub salt into the wounds of the struggling American supersonic program, Concorde soon roared into the United States, arriving at the nation's capital to lobby for landing rights in the US. Some Americans were virulently against allowing Concorde to fly into the United States, citing noise and air pollution concerns. The publicity tour saw the supersonic airliner carrying a plane load of big-name personalities, including senators and congressmen, over Mexico to demonstrate the sensation of flying at twice the speed of sound. It was a smart move and opened many doors for the airliner. The public was fascinated with the jet, flocking to airports to watch it take off and land. It was a sad contrast to the Boeing SST project that had, as its Concorde rivals suspected, never got off the ground. It was simply too grandiose a plan to be implemented in reality. We expect to be in service in early 1978. Uh, this is based on uh, getting uh, approximately a year's flying experience with the prototype uh, prior to uh, a start of the production program. So that would put it about five years behind Concorde. Well, uh, it depends on when you decide the Concorde goes into service. Uh, uh, I'm, I think it's more important myself to talk about the difference in first flight dates. So uh, I will only admit to uh, the difference between uh, uh, the first flight of the Concorde this year and uh, our first flight in uh, 1972. However, the American SST program was discontinued in 1971 following protests from environmental groups concerned that SST engine exhaust would damage the ozone layer or disturb people with sonic booms. But even with six British Airways became the first airline to take possession of a Concorde. The 200-foot-long Delta Wing aircraft was handed over by the British Aircraft Corporation to British Airways Managing Director Henry Marking just six days before the aeroplane was scheduled to make its first passenger flight. British Airways flew the Concorde to Bahrain for its inaugural flight, while Air France flew to Rio de Janeiro. 
the Concorde was a revolution in flight time, slashing the journey time from London to New York from seven to three and a half hours. London to Tokyo was reduced from 14 and three quarters to six and three quarter hours. London to Sydney shrank from 24 hours to 13. One aspect of the Concorde's design that surprised many people was the small size of its interior. There was only room for 100 seats, 40 at the front and 60 at the back, and no space for overhead storage, severely limiting cabin baggage. The seats were narrower than most first-class seats on conventional airliners, but as the Concorde only flew during the day and arrived at its destination so quickly, the smaller seats were not an issue for most passengers. Concorde was powered by four Rolls-Royce Snecma Olympus 593 engines, which produced 38,000 pounds of thrust. They used reheat technology to add fuel to the final stage of the journey, giving extra power for takeoff and to jump to supersonic flight. Concorde's range was 4,143 miles, and the airliner could carry up to 26,286 gallons of fuel, consuming about 5,638 gallons an hour. With the skyline of Australia's most famous city only two hours away, the crossing of the world's largest ocean at Mark II was rapidly becoming part of aviation history. Having crossed half the world in record-breaking time, the realisation of what we'd achieved started to set in. As the passengers continued to enjoy the buzz of Sydney, having covered a staggering 11,447 miles since the pass on New York, Concord Alpha Delta was well due for a service. Whilst down under, there was no shortage of Qantas engineers volunteering for the task, under the watchful eye of BA's own Concord technicians, the supersonic jet receiving a thorough check. With a warning light indicating a possible fault earlier, with one of the aircraft's inertial navigation system boxes, a new replacement was flown in especially from London, ready for Concorde's departure later in the day. Seven days into the trip and four sectors behind them, back in town, the passengers checked out of their luxury hotel for the 20-minute drive back to the departure gate at Sydney's main Kingsford Smith Airport. As they negotiated the Sydney freeways, the crew were already on the tarmac waiting for Concord Alpha Delta's arrival from the hangar. As the aircraft was slowly towed along the web of airport taxiways towards the gate, with departure only an hour away, the race against time to fully prepare the supersonic jet for departure was to begin.
As Concorde's development was gathering pace, so was the Tupolev Tu-144. The Soviet supersonic aircraft flew many test flights and appeared to be achieving success. However, on June 3, 1973, disaster struck. While demonstrating its capabilities at the Paris Air Show, the first Tu-144S production airliner swerved into a violent downward dive. As it tried to pull out of it, the aeroplane broke up, then crashed, destroying 15 houses and killing all six people on board and eight people on the ground. Debate still rages over the cause of the accident. One theory has it that the jet swerved to avoid a French spy plane that was attempting to photograph it. The original reports did not mention the presence of a Mirage military jet. However, later investigations acknowledged the Mirage, and one official statement said, Though the inquiry established that there was no real risk of collision between the two aircraft, the Soviet pilot was likely to have been surprised. Meanwhile, Concorde forged ahead with plans to fly the transatlantic route, despite protests from some quarters. On November 22, 1977, Captain Brian Walpole piloted the jet from London to New York on the aeroplane's first fair-paying flight to that city. Pilot Peter Duffy was a British Airways Concorde captain from 1975 to 1980. In his book, Comets and Concords, he remembers training with test pilots with exercises such as experiencing engine failure at Mach 2.02, more than twice the speed of sound. Spilled air from the intake caused an opposite reaction to what he had expected. Duffy also learned to handle the aircraft without auto stabilization, demonstrating the Concorde's excellent basic stability. He was warned that it was easy to lose height when circling an airfield because although the auto throttles set to control a specific airspeed did an accurate job, a small nose down pitch could result in descent without the pilot realizing it. Duffy said smoothly landing the Concorde was possible through a simple technique. The delta wing produced considerable ground effect, and as the runway approached, it could be sensed as a cushioning feeling, as long as the descent was moderate. One journalist, Robert Hotz, editor of Aviation Week and Space Technology, described his flight in an editorial in the next issue of the magazine. The most sensational aspect of flying as a passenger at Mach 2 in a supersonic transport is that there are no sensations whatsoever that differ from those in the current generation of subsonic jets, he wrote. The only unusual internal noise comes during takeoff, briefly from engine rumble. The cabin noise level without full airline-style soundproofing is about equal to that of a current subsonic jet, with only a slight increase near the aft section. Cabin pressurization maintains a constant 6,500 feet environment, even during supersonic climb and descent. During Mach 2 maneuvers, only the changing color of the sky informs the passengers of major banking turns. It is possible and pleasant to walk around during all flight regimes. Stewards will have no trouble serving martinis and meals. Passengers will find no difficulty consuming them. They will just have to drink a little faster. New York will be only a few hours away. Thus, Concords went into service and became a considerable draw card at airports. However, airlines showed little enthusiasm. The world's other airlines looked to the Boeing 747 jet, a conventional airliner that could carry up to 400 people, compared with the Concorde's paltry 100. But Concorde's continued to operate, serving a very well-heeled, exclusive clientele who are prepared to pay exorbitant prices to enjoy a whisper-quiet flight and a glimpse of Earth's horizon from 60,000 feet in the air. On the ground, people would often stop what they were doing when the Concorde went overhead and crane their necks for a better look. Although Concorde flights were abandoned following an air disaster in France on July 25, 2000, the great supersonic airliner remains a powerful symbol of luxury and progress. As a publicity stunt, Sir Richard Branson offered to buy the British Airways Concorde fleet for the nominal one pound paid by the airliner when it took possession of the first Concords. Although the Paris accident was cited as the reason for withdrawing the jets from service, the main reason was a lack of patronage that was making the flights unviable.
Where to now for supersonic transport? With subspace passenger travel on the cards, thanks to companies like Virgin Galactic, supersonic flight is back in the spotlight. British company Reaction Engines is researching the viability of a hydrogen-fueled airplane that could carry 300 passengers, capable of flying non-stop from Brussels to Sydney at Mach 5 Plus in 4.6 hours. American aerospace company Aeron has reportedly taken $3 billion worth of pre-order sales on its supersonic business jet. Japan's aerospace exploration agency JAXA has performed a series of supersonic test flights in the South Australian desert as part of its plan to develop a new supersonic passenger jet. A few years ago, the first test flight of a Japanese supersonic jetliner design proved spectacular, but it was not the sort of spectacle its designers had hoped for. A problem soon after the rocket launch to boost the unmanned test aircraft into flight resulted in a costly disaster and a lengthy setback for the multi-million dollar project. The great supersonic airliners of the past represented a new era and set many records that still stand today. The complexity of their design and construction has rarely been equaled. Concorde remains an icon of aviation history, with British Airways carrying more than 2.5 million passengers between 1976 and 2003. Millions more enjoyed the view of the sleek Delta Wing as it soared aloft or glided in to land. Many of these people will be hoping it's true that the return of supersonic passenger travel really is only a decade away.